There is currently a genocidal war going on in... No, not that one. By Saudi-led warplanes has killed at least 80 people in Yemen's capital, Sana'a, and in an area along the border with Saudi Arabia. One strike targeted... A superpower run by an oligarchic elite is currently in the midst of a senseless invade. No, not that one either. In Ukraine, an incredibly tragic brother war between two beautiful and incredibly similar European cultures is currently taking place. And the Western media has put all of its efforts into portraying this war as the work of a nostalgic closet communist madman named Putin, who because of childhood trauma... If I was your mother, you would have been so loved, held in the arms of joyous light. Never would the story's plight, the world unfurled before our eyes. Dear President Vladimir Putin, I am not your father, but I could be if you'd let me. Or because of his pseudo-Asiatic Russian brain is invading a defenseless, democratic, and liberal European nation. But if this really is true, why has Ukraine been bombing ethnic Russian civilians in the east of the country for eight years? And where was the Western media when all this happened? Why has Ukraine banned plenty of political parties practically becoming a dictatorship? under Zelensky, and why do neo-Nazis who want to ban race mixing hold important political positions in the country? And lastly, how did this seemingly peaceful country suddenly become the epicenter of a confrontation that could spark a potentially cataclysmic event? Well, to understand these questions, we need to go back in time to the fall of the Soviet Union and the year 1991. In 1991, the Soviet Union under Gorbachev was crumbling under the weight of its own incompetency, and pro-Western Ukrainians whose political parties had been legalized under the political liberalization known as Glasnost, quickly seized the moment and organized an independence referendum, which successfully passed in Ukraine with 92% of the vote. Even the Russian minority in Ukraine that still makes up 20% of the population voted yes in this referendum because they were promised a multinational state. This decision, however, ended up being something they would most likely come to regret. During the election, the pro-Western People's Movement of Ukraine in leaflets also promised that an independent Ukraine would be as prosperous as France. However, the new rulers who ran the now independent Ukrainian state destined the country for a very different fate. As soon as Ukraine had become an independent state, so-called privatization commenced. And what this really meant was that Ukraine's new leaders like vultures started personally converting large, formerly government-owned corporations into their own private estates, with no compensation given to the Ukrainian people. This is how the Ukrainian oligarchy was founded, an evil and clever Kleptocratic elite that runs Ukraine until today, and it will sell itself to the highest bidder at any time. But why did the Soviet Union and its legal successor state, Russia, even allow such a strategic part of its own empire that contains millions of Russians to become independent in the first place, and worse yet, to fall into the hands of an elite that would happily sell itself to the West at any time? There are two reasons for why this was allowed to happen. Firstly, the Soviet Union, and therefore also Russia, as its legal direct successor state had been promised by the U.S. that the American military's sphere of influence called NATO would not expand into any of the former Warsaw Pact countries or the former Soviet Union, which includes Ukraine. The West now denies that this agreement ever took place, but the NGO, the National Security Archive, that releases declassified U.S. government documents, released documents in 2017 that proves that the West gave cascades of assurances about how NATO would not expand eastwards to the Soviet leadership. Here are just some examples of assurances the Western media doesn't want you to know about. President George Bush Sr. had assured the Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev during the Malta summit of December 1989 that the U.S. would not take advantage of the revolutions in Eastern Europe to harm Soviet interests. U.S. Secretary of State James Baker famously said that NATO would not move one inch eastwards when discussing NATO's expansion with Gorbachev on February 9th, 1990. The German Chancellor Helmut Kohl said on the 10th of February 1990 that not only for the Soviet Union, but for other European countries as well, it is important to have guarantees that if the United States keeps its presence in Germany within the framework of NATO, not an inch of NATO's present military jurisdiction will spread in an eastern direction. So it is clear that NATO had promised not to expand into Eastern Europe because the West realized that this would threaten Russia's security interests and potentially provoke 
provoke a war. But this clear promise to the Soviet leadership was however broken, and NATO is now the dominant power in the former Russian area of influence. But why is that? Well, that will clearly be explained by the second reason. The second reason is that the Soviet Union fragmented in ways that not even NATO could have foreseen, and the Russian elite of the early 90s was not concerned with anything else than stealing state-owned companies for themselves. I mean, for the love of God, the last Soviet president starred in a Pizza Hut commercial. Sometimes nothing brings people together like a nice hot pizza from Pizza Hut. This is a man who sold his entire country for Pizza Hut and other such amazing American delights. The Soviet leadership's complete betrayal of their own citizens therefore resulted in Russia becoming so weak, politically unstable and unequal that the Western elite now thought that they could just incorporate all of Eastern Europe into NATO since Russia was just barely getting back on its own feet. But this started changing in the early 2000s when Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, Russia's new and authoritarian yet somewhat competent president took over from the alcoholic Boris Yeltsin, a man who had been nothing more than a puppet of the Russian oligarchy. Vladimir Putin began reasserting Russia's global influence, much to the dismay of the Western elite who had triumphantly proclaimed the end of history, an era that was supposed to have been pioneered by Western interest groups quietly dominating the world through both soft and hard power, including invasions to take out rivaling powers like in Iraq and Yugoslavia. However, Vladimir Putin had different plans because Russia's own elite was not willing to give up its power, and this is where Ukraine enters the equation yet again. During the 2000s, the West had been sponsoring countless so-called color revolutions in post-Soviet countries that succeeded in overthrowing these countries' corrupt governments and replacing them with equally corrupt but pro-Western governments. This too happened in Ukraine in 2004 when a pro-Western government was installed in Kiev thanks to a pro-Western supported revolution called the Orange Revolution. However, this did not last long because in 2000 in 2010, the oligarch Viktor Yanukovych, who was a member of the pro-Russian Party of Regions, was democratically elected president of Ukraine in an election that was recognized as legitimate by all international observers. This expression of actual Ukrainian democracy, however, did not suit Western geopolitical interests, who then started supporting both corrupt mainstream opposition groups and ultra-nationalist political organizations with the aim of overthrowing Ukraine's democratically elected government for the crime of simply not aligning with the Western elite's geopolitical ambitions. These Ukrainian opposition forces that the West supported were, for example, the notoriously corrupt oligarch Petro Poroshenko, who is currently being accused of state treason for his actions as president between 2014 and 2019. Other moderate rebels who gained Western support included the neo-fascist organization Svoboda, who worships the Nazi collaborator Stefan Bandera. Svoboda's policies included banning non-ethnic Ukrainians which includes Russians who make up 20% of the population from holding public office and one of their slogans is for example one nation one race one fatherland oh cool I guess that must mean that they want to give the Russian areas independence so they can finally get rid of them right nope instead they want to treat Russians like second-class citizens despite being somewhat pro-russian president Viktor Yanukovych tried to continue having a good relationship with the West likely with the hope of turning Ukraine into a somewhat pro-russian state but still a somewhat somewhat neutral state that would reap the benefits of playing both sides. However, Yanukovych had not understood one critical geopolitical reality, and that was that the Western elite didn't need neutral partners. They needed proxy states that would help containing Russia's resurgence. Yanukovych was therefore left with two choices. Either he needed to become a member of the customs union with Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan, thus moving further towards Russia, or alternatively, become an associate member of the European Union, thus further moving moving towards the West, a choice he had severe difficulties making despite rising levels of pressure by both parties. But in late 2013, Yanukovych made up his mind and suspended the signing of the agreement with the EU in favor of the Russian Customs Union. And as soon as this happened, the West told their proxies, whom the Western press described as freedom-loving young Ukrainians, that now was the time to overthrow the democratically elected government of Ukraine. The following overthrow of the pro 
Russian government was called the Euromaidan Revolution in the West, and many very suspicious things happened during these very bloody events. During the Euromaidan, many pro-Western protesters and pro-Russian police officers were documented being killed by snipers. And while one certainly would not put it past a corrupt oligarch like Viktor Yanukovych as having ordered these killings, what really happened seems far more vague. Because in a leaked phone call between the Estonian Foreign Minister Urmas Payet and EU Foreign Policy Chief Kathy Ashton, it is suggested that these snipers were actually working for the Western proxies with the goal of radicalizing pro-Western Ukrainians and justifying Western support. And civil society. And second, what was quite disturbing, the same Olga told that, well, all the evidence shows uh, that people who were killed by snipers from both sides, among policemen and, and people from the streets, that they were the same snipers killing people from both sides. So that, and then she also showed me some photos. Uh, she said that has medical doctor, she can, you know, say that it is the same, same handwriting, the same type of bullets. And it's really disturbing that now the new, uh, new coalition that they don't want to investigate what exactly happened. So that there is now stronger and stronger understanding that behind snipers, they were, it was not Yanukovych, but it was somebody from the new coalition. The Western media running their usual propaganda stories like in Vietnam, Grenada, Panama, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, and Syria naturally did not focus on this and instead helped making black propaganda videos like I Am Ukrainian Go Viral, a heart-wrenching video created by people from the organization named the National Endowment for Regime Change, I mean democracy, a so-called NGO that practically receives all of its funding from the U.S. government. Seeing the writing on the wall Yanukovych fled to his own masters in Moscow, thus allowing the Western proxies to take over power in all of Ukraine. The new Western proxy government was then set up and controlled by the United States, which was proven in yet another leaked phone call between the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine and Viktor Nuland from the U.S. State Department, where they discussed which people the new government should consist of. What do you think? Uh, I think we're in play. Um, the the uh, Klitschko piece is obviously the complicated electron here, um, especially the announcement of him as deputy prime minister. And, and you've seen some of my notes on the troubles in the marriage right now. So we're trying to get a read really fast on where he is on this stuff. But I think your argument to him, which you'll need to make, I think that's the next phone call we want to set up, is exactly the one you made to, to Yachts. And I, I'm glad you sort of put him on the spot on where he fits in this scenario. And I'm very glad he said what he said in response. Good. So uh, I don't think Cleet should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you think well, in terms of him not going into the government, just let him sort of stay out and do his political homework and stuff. I'm just thinking in terms of sort of the process moving ahead, we want to keep the moderate Democrats together. The problem is going to be Tony Book and his guys. And, you know, I'm sure that's part of what Yanukovych is calculating on all of this. Um, I, I, kinda... I, I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tony Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. I, I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yatsenyuk. It's just not going to work. Yeah, no, I think, that's, I think that's right. Okay. Seriously, these people need to get a secure program for planning their cartoon villain schemes. Here we can clearly see that the Ukrainian neo-Nazis were nothing more than useful idiots and the U.S. were ready to replace them with people who were more friendly towards IMF loans the first minute they could get away with it. Ukraine's old pro-Russian government was now replaced by an equally corrupt and also supremacist pro-Western government whose first policies included the following, accepting an IMF loan loan package of $15 billion of so-called aid that further allowed Western international finance to enslave the Ukrainian people, the complete opposite of true patriotism. But the Ukrainian nationalists were fine with selling their souls to the West as long as they were allowed to oppress the Russian minority. So the second thing the new Ukrainian government did was repealing a law giving ethnic minorities like Russians who make up 20% of Ukraine the possibility to use their own language in official business. This provoked a severe and violent reaction in the Russian-speaking areas of the country, including Crimea, an incredibly strategic
strategic and historically Russian part of the country. During the overthrow of Ukraine's democratically elected and pro-Russian government, Russia's elite led by Putin were seeing this as their final chance to stop NATO's expansion, an expansion that they had been promised would have never occurred in the first place. Because to the Russian elite, it was clear that the Western elite was never going to be satisfied until all non-Western powers in Europe were subjugated, thus forcing Putin's hand, because it was now or never if NATO's expansion was to be stopped. Therefore, unmarked Russian soldiers claiming to be self-defense forces who had somehow magically acquired Russian BTRs relatively peacefully annexed Crimea, where they were met with relief and gratitude from the residents who had never wanted to be part of Ukraine in the first place. Since it was only because of the Soviet Union's chaotic collapse that these Russian-speaking regions who were once part of the Ukrainian administrative division of the Soviet Union had also remained part of the Ukrainian nation-state, an outcome that dismayed many Russians living there. Exit polls from today's referendum in Crimea show overwhelming support for separation from Ukraine and for unification with Russia. However, the rest of Ukraine's Russian territories would not be so lucky as to be peacefully incorporated into the Russian Federation. In these regions, Russian Ukrainians demanded autonomy from the centralized Ukrainian state that clearly did not want them. <laughs> Самое главное, против чего мы стоим, мы стоим против фашизма. Откровенный фашизм сейчас легализуется в Украине. Не против Донбасса, против всех, кто говорит на русском. Все видели видеообращение, да, там, где говорят, стрелять всех, кто говорит на русском, стрелять тех, кто стоит под российским флагом. А российский флаг для нас – это символ протеста нашего против существующей сейчас ситуации на Украине. Тот флаг, который поднимают сейчас те, кто за единую Украину, он себя дискредитировал, потому что под ним стоят фашисты. And as you can imagine, since a new pro-Western government with true European ideals was formed, these demands were met and everyone lived happily ever after. Just kidding. Instead, the Ukrainian government brutally suppressed these efforts and sponsored neo-Nazis from the right sector that brutally murdered an unknown number of people in Odessa alone, including a pregnant woman who was strangulated by the Ukrainian nationalists inside the regional administrative building. This building was then set on fire, which resulted in the deaths of over 50 pro-Russian protesters. The Western government claims it's unclear how the fire started, but these videos show very clearly that the Ukrainian nationalists started the fire by throwing Molotov cocktails into the building while police stood by. This naturally gave the pro-Russian protesters in the rest of the country two choices, either live in your ancestral homeland as a second-class citizen or fight, and the Russians of the Lugansk and Donetsk regions chose the second option, preferring to rather die standing and fighting for the idea of freedom against overwhelming Ukrainian military power supported by the West. If you, and I just look, turn off the light and prepare the storm, against who? Against us, the military officers, who only want to conduct a referendum? But unlike in Odessa, this time the pro-Russian protesters were not alone. Thanks to Russian volunteers and troops sent by the Kremlin, the separatists quickly seized the regional administrative centers in both regions and proclaimed the People's Republic of Lugansk and Donetsk. And their demands were that elections should be held to determine the two regions' futures. The Ukrainian government refused this demand and instead started a brutal offensive using heavy weaponry that has shelled countless residential areas, resulting in massive destruction and civilian casualties, with the total number of casualties from the war reaching more than 13,000 people, including many, many civilians. Naturally, this use of heavy weaponry against civilian areas was not seriously condemned by neither the Western press nor governments, but that is hardly surprising since the Western elite, with its own population's consent, has been bankrolling and providing the bombs for the incredibly brutal and genocidal bombs.
bombing campaign that Saudi Arabia has perpetrated against the people of Yemen for eight years, which has resulted in over 150,000 deaths. The West itself has also committed terroristic bombing campaigns, like for example against Serbia in 1999 that killed between 500 and 2,000 civilians. So again, the West does not care about war crimes or human rights. And this bombing campaign, for example, was actually celebrated by the Western media at the time. During the offensive against pro-Russian protesters and separatists in Donbass, described by the Ukrainian government as an anti-terrorist operation, the Ukrainian government allowed neo-Nazis from the organizations the right sector, Svoboda, and the Social National Assembly to start their own government-sponsored paramilitary forces, one of them becoming the Asov Regiment, whose leader Andrei Beletsky has said it is the Ukrainian nation's mission to lead the white races of the world in a final crusade against the Semite-led Untaminchen. The Asov Regiment is today an openly neo-Nazi regiment that is an official part of the Ukrainian National Guard and is also, as of March 2022, dying in Ukraine for a president and a prime minister who are both Jewish. Talk about irony. Also, if you are still doubting whether or not the Asov Regiment truly is a neo-Nazi organization, then I would like to show you this. I personally went into their official Telegram group where it took me not more than 30 seconds to find people shouting praises of Adolf Hitler and glorifying the murder of Russians. Again, this is from the official telegram group of a large and official Ukrainian military unit. Many soldiers also have SS tattoos and inside their barracks, a lot of Third Reich iconography can be spotted. I did ask the Asov regiment for an interview so I could hear their side of the story, which would genuinely be very interesting, but sadly, they only sent me this copy pasta appeal to the Western media back to me. However, this is understandable as they are currently in the middle of a war where they're being thrown against impossible odds by a leadership that despises them, and they are actually proving themselves a very competent force by holding on to the city of Mariupol for an extended period of time. However, despite these far-right groups, both in 2014 and today, proving themselves to be some of the most competent regiments within the Ukrainian armed forces, the offensives against the two republics in 2015 had little success, and therefore both sides signed the Minsk II ceasefire agreement that included the promise of giving Donetsk and Lugansk special constitutional autonomy. This agreement, however, sadly quickly fell apart because of countless violations from both parties and ever since 2014 the civilians of Donbass have been living under a bombing campaign perpetrated by both sides just for the crime of wanting self-determination. And this bombing campaign first ended when Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022 finally bringing an end to the eight-year-long and intentionally underreported bombing campaign. And now you might say but aren't these two separatist republics also just really Russian proxy states and yes they most certainly are are, but that was always going to be inevitable considering that they are militarily dependent on the Russian Federation and that their final goal is to join the Russian Federation. But if you think that the separatist forces are predominantly made up of Russian soldiers on the other hand, I would like to show you this video from when the strategic city of Mariupol was captured by Ukrainian forces in 2014. People were being hit, some of them civilians, caught in crossfire. We found a man being carried away in a car. Another man was then hit and wounded just a few meters away. As they help a third victim, the sound you're about to hear was the crack of a bullet passing overhead. Our guard killing us. It, it, it was very scary. We won't ever be under uh, the fascist government. Clearly, all these boomers must be Russian FSB agents, right? So to recap, we can conclude the following. We can conclude that the Western elite used the collapse of the Soviet Union to strengthen the Western grip over Europe by incorporating Russia's previous sphere of influence into their own empire, despite having promised Russia that this would not happen, and despite also being aware that this would likely provoke a severe reaction from the Russian elite. We can also conclude that the West overthrew the democratically elected government of Ukraine in 2014 and replaced it with a puppet government controlled by the United States and Ukrainian oligarchs and that this overthrow was what started the crisis in Ukraine in the first place. We can finally also conclude that while Putin is overblowing the presence of neo-Nazism in Ukraine, neo-Nazis obviously do have a large amount of government influence and the new Ukrainian government has been actively discriminating against Russians, which is what caused the Russian regions of 
of Ukraine to seek for independence in the first place. Also, to be clear, I'm not pro-Putin or pro-Russia. I am pro-truth, which means painting a balanced picture of the situation. I am not claiming that Russia is anything but a kleptocratic empire, but my point is that the West is also a kleptocratic empire that is just as bad, if not even worse. And in this case, the West is the clear aggressor that is threatening world peace only to strengthen its own geopolitical position. Personally, I have a political position that is completely different from that of the West and Russia, but unlike the media that is owned by the rich and powerful, I am not paid to spread lies in an attempt to rile up an easily influenced population for a new war. And while I am completely for Ukrainians having self-determination, the Russian areas that were so unfortunate as to having been included within the borders of the modern Ukrainian nation-state deserve exactly the same right to self-determination. And I wonder where all these freedom-loving people of the internet were during the eight years where they were fighting for their survival against the Ukrainian state. And finally, to all the great American patriots currently writing harshly worded messages to me in the comments, I wish to end this video with a little quote from a Texan politician called Ron Paul. Shutting down military bases and ceasing to deal with other nations with threats and violence is not isolationism, it is the opposite. Opening ourselves up to friendship, honest trade and diplomacy is the foreign policy of peace and prosperity. It is the only foreign policy that will not bankrupt us in the short order as our current actions most definitely will. I share the disappointment of the American people in the foreign policy rhetoric coming from the administration. The sad thing is, our foreign policy will change eventually, as Rome's did, when all budgetary and monetary tricks to fund it are exhausted. That is all for today. Next time, we will look at what kind of country Ukraine has become under its new pro-Western government, how Zelensky is merely a puppet who has received enormous funds of stolen money from an Israeli-Ukrainian oligarch, and lastly, how the Western media is unashamedly lying about the Ukrainian military's behavior, the treatment of prisoners, and the situation in general. Thank you guys so much for watching the video. Again, consider donating on Patreon. Everything goes a long way and is a great help because making these videos take a considerable amount of time and effort. I hope everyone has a wonderful day or night. And remember, share the video everywhere you can. See you soon.